Hello again, statistics students. Today we're going to start um, a section on chi-squared distributions. For our purposes, there are two types of chi-squared tests. There are plenty. In fact, um, if you're taking my in-class version as I uh, make this video, you might remember that we discussed it back when we were talking about confidence intervals for standard DEVs, for instance. But we're not going to use chi-squared for that purpose. We're going to use it to test multiple proportions, um, sometimes known as an independence test. We're also going to do the goodness of fit test, which I'm going to show you here. So let's talk about what um, the chi-squared test um, means, what it tells us, what it's going to do for us. So let's go find the uh, chart. It's on page uh, 330 of the current textbook we're using. And what you need to know is that uh, um, all values of chi-square are greater than or equal to zero, because you can see it's a squared divided by a squared term. So it's always going to be positive. And you can see that, like a t-curve, it is a family of curves. Um, for each number of degrees of freedom, there is a different chi-squared curve. So if there are only two degrees of freedom, it kind of looks like this. Uh, it looks like a kind of sort of an exponential decay curve. Once you get to about five degrees of freedom, though, you get to the actual, what we recognize as the shape of a chi-squared distribution. And that's a peak and then um, a right skew. So when we say that the um, chi-squared distribution is positively skewed and therefore not uh, uh, symmetric, that's what we mean. And of course, because we're going to be doing probabilities on this, the total area under the chi-squared distribution is equal to 1. So now let's get into our uh, lesson for today. <clears throat> As I've said, for our purposes, there are going to be two uses of the chi-squared test. One is the chi-squared goodness of fit test, which we're going to use today, learn about today. And the second is the chi-squared test for independence. Let's start with the goodness of fit test. The goodness of fit test um, is going to test whether a relative frequency distribution fits an expected distribution. Now think about what a relative frequency distribution is. It's percentages, fractions, or proportions of a whole. You can go back to uh, what was probably chapter one or chapter two of our current textbook to learn about relative frequencies. Now the fun part about chi-squared is that, or at least the chi-squared goodness of fit test, is that the null and alternate hypothesis are always, always, always the same. Your, um, our current textbook drags it out a little, <clears throat> makes it seem a bit more difficult. I simplify it. Your null and alternate hypotheses are simply the given distribution is correct or the given distribution is not correct. <clears throat> that's it. That's what you that's all you write for every null and alternate hypothesis when you're doing a chi-squared goodness of fit test. Either the given distribution is correct or it's not. Now, you might be asking what that means. We'll talk about it in a moment. Now, interestingly enough, the chi-squared test compares percentages. Um, again, we're talking relative frequency. But it looks at actual counts. So let's take a look at a problem in the current textbook we're using. It's on page 527. And I've got a picture of that. 
<coughs> somewhere. There it is. <clears throat> so in a recent year, 15 and a half percent of people didn't go to the doctor at all. And that would be the doctor, the emergency room, um, or any type of home visit. One to three visits, you had almost half of the population. Four to nine visits in one year, um, almost 25% of the population. And 10 or more visits, 13% of the population. Now, this is population data. This is what we think the entire population looks like. Now, it says at the bottom, a researcher randomly selects 200 people and asks them how many visits they make to the doctor in a year. What is the expected frequency for each of these? All righty. Let's take a look at what that means. <clears throat> So again, here are our, um, you can't see me pointing on the screen. <clears throat> here are our categories. And here are our expected percentages. So if we surveyed 200 people, we would expect 15 and a half percent of those 200 people not to have visited the doctor at all we would expect 46.8% of those 200 people to have visited one, two, or three times, et cetera. Very important, your expected counts always have to add up to your sample size. Otherwise, you've done something very, very wrong. Of course, all these percentages have to add up to 100% also, or you've done something very, very wrong. <clears throat> so what we're saying in our null hypothesis here is either this distribution is correct. In other words, we'll get expected, we'll get observed values very close to these expected values. Or the alternate is it's not correct. So if we look at some conditions that have to be met on our current textbook, they're on page 525. <clears throat> Your observed counts um, have to be obtained by a simple, by a random sample. And expected counts all must be at least five. If they're not at least five, then your sample size isn't big enough. And in a goodness of fit test, your degrees of freedom is your number of categories minus one. On um, this problem, we had four categories. We had either you hadn't visited the doctor at all in the last year, you went one to three times, four to nine times, or 10 or more times. That's four categories, three degrees of freedom. So let's go back now and gather some data. We've um, got our hypotheses. Our hypotheses are the null is the given distribution um, is correct. And the alternate is no, it's not. So here are our expected counts. And then we gathered some data. And we got our observed or actual counts. <clears throat> now, again, your observed and actual counts have to add up to the same number as your expected counts, which has to add up to your sample size. And if that doesn't happen, 
you know, uh, your test isn't going to come out right. So to calculate the chi-squared statistic, we take observed minus expected, quantity squared, divided by expected. O minus E, quantity squared, divided by E. Then you add them all up, and that's your chi-squared statistic. So O minus E, quantity squared, divided by E. So here's the data from the previous slide, all in black. Now I've added a new column in blue. <clears throat> That's my chi-squared. These are my chi-squared components for this category. Um, observed minus expected, O minus E, 9. Quantity squared is 81. 81 divided by 31, divided by E, gives me this value. So this is the component of the chi-squared statistic for this category. 100 minus 93.6 is 6.4. Square that, you're gonna get, well, I don't know, what, something close to 40? And then divide that by 93.6, there's your chi-squared component. Do that for each of your categories and add them up. And our chi-squared statistic is 6.225. So what we need to do here now is calculate a um, critical value for the chi-squared statistic. And so we write that as, this is my chi-squared statistic for three degrees of freedom. I got this um, value here. And I need to look up my chi-squared critical value. So we look in your table on page A19, and I didn't plan this out well. I uh, didn't notice that I had to get to the book again. We'll go to the back of the book, A19. That is a chi-squared table. <clears throat> and a chi-squared table, <clears throat> is read kind of like a t-table. All the values in the middle of the chi-squared table are critical values. And your alpha is listed at the top and degrees of freedom at the left. So if I'm doing a one-tailed test to the right, in which I am, um, the, these two tails are like if you're trying to do a confidence interval for a standard div or a variance. We just want to know if our chi-squared statistic is bigger than some number. And if it is, then we'll reject the null. So we're doing a right-tailed test. And we had three degrees of freedom. And if we want a 5% alpha, we come over here to uh, 7.815. Again, three degrees of freedom, 5% alpha. 7.815 is our critical value for the chi-squared statistic. <clears throat> so we'll <clears throat> zoom back out. Now our chi-squared statistic was 6.225. Our critical value is 7.815 at the 5% level. <clears throat> Since we are not in the rejection region, the rejection region was anything to the right of 7.815, and we're to the left of it, we would fail to reject the null. So in that case, um, if the null hypothesis is the given distribution is correct, we would fail to reject that null at the 5% level and conclude that there is not enough evidence to state that the uh, distribution is incorrect. Remember that last part, we'd like to talk about the um, alternate hypothesis. The alternate is that it's incorrect, and we didn't have sufficient evidence for that. So you might say then that um, 
to be the most detailed possible, your conclusion would be we would fail to reject the null hypothesis at the 5% level. There is not sufficient evidence to conclude that um, the given distribution is incorrect. Therefore, I'm going to conclude it's correct pending further evidence. When we fail to reject the null hypothesis, we didn't prove the null is true. We just didn't have enough evidence to reject it. So I can conclude that it might be true pending further evidence. Now, just as an interesting note, if you take five um, standard normal variables, and standard normal variables, remember, have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, and um, you take a whole bunch of those and you square them and add them up, you keep five at a time, five at a time, five at a time. Um, you're going to get a chi-squared statistic with five degrees of freedom. So the mean of a chi-squared distribution is its degrees of freedom, which means if you look on your chi-squared table, if you want to kind of see where that chi-squared curve would balance if it were on a teeter-totter, it will balance right at the um, value for your degrees of freedom. And as degrees of freedom gets bigger and bigger and bigger, your chi-squared curve is going to approach normal. It'll never get there because remember, a normal curve is, um, goes um, to plus and minus infinity, and a chi-squared curve can only get to zero on the left-hand side. It's never negative. But if you had eight zillion data points, your mean would be so far to the right that that curve off to the left side, yeah, it'd be pretty darn close to uh, pretty darn close to normal. So that's an introduction to the chi-squared goodness of fit test. Um, take a look at that section of the book. Try to follow the example problems they give you, and have a great day.